Live from Miami Beach, Florida, it's theCUBE, covering UiPath Forward Americas. Brought to you by UiPath. Welcome back to Miami, everybody. UiPath Forward Americas, hashtag UiPath. You're watching theCUBE, the leader in live tech coverage. Dave Vellante here for my co-host, Stu Miniman. Anthony Abatista is here, he's a principal in robotics and intelligent automation at Deloitte. Big consultancy, SI Anthony, thanks for coming on theCUBE. Thanks for having me, it's great to be here. So, when, when the SIs and the consultancies lean in, you know it's a big business, you know it's strategic, and it's sort of wor life changing, world changing. What's your role at Deloitte, and then we'll get into what you see in the market space. So, my role now is uh, broadly in intelligent automation and really scaling our practice, looking at what's next, and if you think about automation in and of itself and RPA, um, if you're not careful, it could be a race to the bottom, is our view, and just automating things um, without a business case, without sustainability, without thinking about what's next, um, you know, is, is probably a race to the bottom from a results perspective. So what we like to do is think about what intelligent components can we have, not just in technology, but around the business case, um, around the actual implementation to say, you know, how do we just not take people out? How do we think about the future of work? Uh, what's the impact on an industry? And how can we make something more of that and make this a sustainable part of the technology landscape, not just a, let's go take some bodies out. Yeah, so the, the, the race to the bottom, I'm inferring, would be the hollowing out of the employee base without a plan to sort of retrain and redeploy people and actually add business value, just pure cost cutting for automation for automation's sake versus what? What are you advising well, your clients? Well, and the race to the bottom also would include just doing automation for the sake of doing automation, and you know, my joke here with the theme of the conference of accelerate everything. <laughs> um, yeah, I said I'm not sure that's exactly right. It's accelerate the right things. Um, it's accelerate things that have the highest value. So I do think the race to the bottom is if you're not careful, you could just be doing automations, putting in bots, and I've seen a lot of programs start to fail or people start to question them. Um, if you don't have that longer view of automating the right things and accelerating the right things. Uh, the second part of that is, you know, there's context, there's interactions, and without some of the advanced cognitive components, uh, without text, without speech, uh, without machine learning and getting smarter as you do this, um, it'll be a race to the bottom if you're not doing those things. Yeah, so. I mean, Anthony, it's everything in business. If you start having meetings for meetings sake, they, they get out of hand. You know, in the infrastructure right. space, we have sprawl of every single technology out there. Maybe give us a little insight. What are you seeing as some of the, the real ways that you know, companies get value out of this, help propel their business forward, help uh, their employees uh, be more fulfilled and uh, not be doing drudgery work? So, that's a lot all in, all in one question or a lot. Um, I think, first of all, this is not a technology or a business problem, and this goes back to you know, my 30, almost 35 years of working in technology. We still need business and technology alignment to make the real programs work. And I know some vendors have come out and said, this is easy, just go build a bot, and business people can do this, and quickly it becomes a technology problem if you're successful, or if you're not successful, it becomes a technology problem. So, I do think, one thing I'm seeing is the best programs have business-led and technology-enabled, but the leadership is aligned around how to do these programs. The second piece is having a business case. If we're going to automate some things that are low-hanging fruit, understanding the difference between that and where there are places we're digging in, leaning in, to you know, some good old-fashioned process work, or asking the question, am I you know, going to do best practice? Am I going to get some industry consultants in that know the difference between good and great, or what I'm doing? And, can maybe guide me there quickly. Um, I think people who are taking that approach and sort of knowing why they're doing the program, if it's low hanging fruit, that's fine. You might do some throwaways, but also having a long view of if I'm going to dig in, how do I get that value? How do I bring people in to help me get that value and not just repave the cow path? So take us through the business case. Maybe we could go through some examples, but what's the framework look like? Obviously, you know, save money, make money, okay, but you guys are going to get a lot more sophisticated than that. But with something like this, I, I presume you don't want to initially boil the ocean. You want to have a long-term view, get some quick wins that are maybe you know, gain shares going forward. Maybe take us through 
a framework using some of the examples that you've worked with on, on clients? What does it look like, the business case? So, first there's the back office business case, and I think those are best understood. So how do I automate financial processes or HR processes? Um, a lot of those are pretty easy to do on an industry agnostic basis for the most part. And those typically do have the, can I close the books faster? Is there value in um, maybe taking some people out or redeploying them? And I think those are pretty well understood uh, across the industry, various industries. So expense reporting you know, approval is an obvious one, right? right? Because you're pushing the button every time, approved, approved, approved. Uh, like say, reporting gets to be a little, gets to be more interesting, so you're, you're compressing the time to reporting. Again, doing sort of manual tax. And does that have a value to the street or to your investors or to just not elongating the whole process? Yeah, and, okay. Uh, you know, the company I worked in, uh, we, we moved from a 10-day close to a one-day close. It took us seven years of working hard to do that. Uh, now, people are thinking about continuous closes. You know, what do my books look like every day? Can I do valuations in certain industries? Um, so I do think if there's business value to do that, um, again, these business cases are pretty well understood. I think where it gets interesting is we get to industry-specific business cases. So, uh, if I'm running an insurance company, for example, can I improve customer sat and doesn't matter that I move the needle as far as renewals. Um, again, um, can I improve customer sat by maybe adjudicating a claim um, quickly, getting you the check and not having it be a big hassle. Uh, if there's no bodily injury or something we have to dig into, can I use robotics and other technology to, to help have a happier customer, maybe save some cost, uh, redesign the process, not have an inspector go out or an adjuster go look at things. Um, so I think technologies play together well. Um, the other is creating capacity in that same model. Um, I have a client who really was about to go out and build some new buildings. Uh, their business was growing very nicely, but they were about to undertake a major capital investment to build buildings and service their business the way they were doing it. And they'd make money doing that, but they made more money by not building the building and not hiring 1,000 or 1,500 people that would fill it and said, how can we use automation to stave off that investment? So, CapEx, OpEx, now you start getting into some models that are not traditional. It's not just save some heads, but it's create capacity. I think I could probably count on one hand. I think so, uh, yeah. The number of companies that have the capabilities of Deloitte in terms of its global presence, its industry expertise. Other than that sort of cartel, if you will, how do you differentiate? So, one thing is we're very deeply technically competent and uh, one of the reasons I came back out of the industry and joined the firm was our bench and technology competency. So we can go with the best of them about sizing and scaling. Uh, not just filling a school bus, but making size and scale with industry expertise in our technical people. So I do think our technology bench is really strong because everybody has a love and business savvy. We like our business people to be tech savvy and our tech people to be business savvy. And that's sort of part of the culture. Uh, I think the second piece is our ability to think from an industry perspective. Um, even if we're screwing some things in or going for a go live, I think our continuous um, industry uh, points of views, our deep knowledge, um, means we can bring an expert in at any time and any place to, to weigh in to some of the work we're doing. And uh, sometimes that happens as a matter of course. It might be a technical project, go build 40, 50 bots, but while we're there, we bring something more uh, on a regular basis. Uh, I also think uh, we don't just do work for the sake of doing work. We're very focused on the business case, uh, sharing success. Uh, we've got some major automation projects, intelligent automation projects that we're at risk uh, in our fees and we've got aligned rewards. So I think that makes us different, uh, different and maybe worth really? a little more premium in the market. So that's, I mean, oftentimes clients are afraid to sign up for those deals because the business case could be so attractive they could be writing a big check. They want to uh, keep the upside for themselves and have more operating leverage, but but you've found that, well certainly you're willing to take that, that, that risk because you understand the, the reward and that's kind of cool. I mean, the payoff must be pretty good. Maybe better than normal in an engagement? Well it is and it's really interesting. Uh, we brought several of these to the door and said how about we go into a risk sharing or reward sharing kind of uh, situation and people have said we're going to give you a lot of money if this works and they've had exactly, you know, let's just move back to a fixed price or a, a bounded in scope project. So. And we don't mind that either. Great negotiating tactic, right? There you go. I, I want to go back to the, the industry discussion we were just having before. Sure. Uh, we, we saw in the big data world, one of the biggest challenges was 
when you looked at deployments, everything was custom. It wasn't very repeatable. Uh, I was at the Microsoft show two weeks ago and they said for AI, they're going to create you know, industry specific groups to be able to really focus on AI, IoT and the like. In, in this space, uh, for, for, for the robotic automation, are there certain industries that you're seeing ahead of the curve uh, in this? Are, are there things that, you know, is it going to be very industry specific? You said, you know, HR is very generalized, but give us a little more color if you can. So, it's interesting you mentioned big data because I think the best automation is driven with data and analytics and feedback in the background. So I think the best industries are the ones that are most promising are places where there is a massive amount of data that we can apply automation and intelligent automation too. So, uh, Couple of standouts, uh, healthcare, life sciences, massive amounts of data, a massive data channel, and they're very used to working with data and investing in data and automation. And you can pretty quickly close the loop. Uh, the second is financial services, uh, where uh, using automation to run more models, to uh, handle more calls, to handle more interactions. Uh, and then certainly in consumer focused things, uh, can we have a good experience um, in a retail channel or a customer support channel uh, by using automation. Again, sometimes people are happier interacting with a, a bot or an intelligent agent than they are. Yes, it, did, did, did those bots pass the Turing test yet? Excuse me? Did they pass the Turing test? Yeah, I, some of them are getting close, right? I mean, uh, but I still think there's some work to do there. <laughs> so some of the mistakes people made, I'm inferring from your comments, you know, people don't have a plan, they don't have the business case, they don't have the business technology al uh, alignment. What are the big mistakes that, you know, what are we missing here that people should try to avoid? Well, I think alignment and then the sponsorship, like having that business case and not getting lost on the way, or we get X million dollars into a program and somebody starts sniping at it. So I also think booking the benefits and having your CFO or some operator on board who's actually booking the benefits, whether they're uh, takeouts, redeployments, or you know, even customer sale or other things, if you're going to push the needle, somebody needs to measure it. And then, uh, and then advice, Let's flip it around to the sort of positive side. Advice for people who want to get started. Uh, obviously, it sounds like you got, you got to have the, the sponsorship. What, pick something that's going to give a fast return? You want quick hits, is that right? Yeah, you want some early success. And I'd say don't boil the ocean, to use your words before. Um, find some, but also understand the longer term picture and don't get again onto this, let's go live and let's pick the first 500. You know, pick 10. Uh, get going, uh, have some success. I think two years ago we spent a lot of time on looking at technology, doing POCs. Uh, I think people are getting beyond that now and you can quickly say, all right, if we're going to do a POC, let's make it real. Let's not make it a science project, but let's get a real area where there's real sponsorship and let's go build the first 10 bots. So I'd infer from that that the, so the POC, the investment might be a little bit larger, but the payback is going to be more substantive. Right. right, people are willing to take that chance if the economy's good, so why not? And also, why spend two or three months doing science projects, or more in some companies? And when you, when you do these early projects, are you narrowly focused on sort of a part of the organization, or are you involving more constituencies and herding more cats, or is it sort of just depend and, and both? So I think what's typical is, if there's a business person or a tech person thinking about this broadly, you typically might do a strategy piece of work that says, is there a business case at a high level? Typical consulting. Yep. Um, then, are there ways that we could find sponsorship in an area and start somewhere? Now, assuming the big business case can be worked out and you have some learning, uh, start somewhere. Uh, but I think the ones that try to start broadly and do too much in too many areas, uh, unless you're very careful, might make no one happy and prove nothing to anyone. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, that could be a failure, but we do have some customers where we've gone out and gone to multiple areas, HR, finance, some of the back office places all at once, and said we're going to do a POC in each one. If they've got the discipline uh, and they want to work on those things at once, it just makes it into a program rather than a project, and that's what we're going to do. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Anthony, any, any uh, feedback you have on the, on the go marketplace? How important is that to customers? We always wor wonder how much you know, co-creation will happen uh, from the users, uh, you know, that kind of dynamic. So, you know, I, I work in a place where all we have is our people and our intellectual capital, so uh, I can say personally I'm suspicious of marketplaces and places you post your wares, and I don't think it's that easy. Uh, with that said, I do think there's opportunities to um, to help each other to sort of think of it as an open source opportunity or a, a way to show eminence and, and thought in the market. So uh, I think we'll participate cautiously in those kinds of environments. Uh, we like to see some structure around that. 
Um, I think other vendors have similar marketplaces, not just in the RPA space, but in the technology space. Uh, but I have to think what's in it and are we creating a false expectation if we put solutions there. So I think it's good to be in the market, it's good to open source some things and play. Uh, but I think we always want to be careful about that. And I really like what I'm seeing from UiPath's marketplace, the way they're thinking about it, which is having certain levers. Is it an internal marketplace? Can we have customers and people use it in a controlled environment rather than just being a, a bazaar or a free for all? Free -for -all. What is the relationship with UiPath? So uh, we've been working with UiPath probably for since they started, uh, both as a, a customer and, and with our customers. Um, and we have various, uh, our relationship is deep. You know, we, we sponsor events like this. Uh, we are a reseller uh, and we are working on uh, you know, formalizing some of that uh, potentially as an alliance partner in the future. But our relationship is deep, uh, hands-on, going to clients, going to more, you know, uh, working together to serve our, our joint clients. Great, Anthony, love the independent perspective. You guys are always about, you know, te technology is important, but the people side, the process side, the business outcome is really what you're all about. So thanks very much for coming on theCUBE. And Thank you, it's been great being here. All right, keep it right there, everybody. Stu and I will be back right after this short break. We're live UiPath Forward from Miami. You're watching theCUBE.